Okay, time for another video. Uh, today's video is about air pollution. Now, this is a pretty important chapter um, and important to start thinking about pollution because 30% of the exam is based on pollution. Uh, air pollution and water pollution and uh, all the different kinds of pollution that you have to be aware of. But uh, something to remember, uh, as I try to point out, is in pollution, they really want you to be able to name names. They want you to talk about where the pollution comes from, what the effects of the pollution are, and in some cases, uh, they do want you to know the chemical reactions as well. So uh, pollution is a pretty uh, important chapter. So we'll start off by talking about the Asian brown cloud. The idea here is that pollution has uh, run amok here in, uh, in South Asia, and especially around cities. So because of automobile traffic, industrial processes, clearing out uh, forests, uh, there has been a steady um, a cloud uh, of pollution over these cities. And I have read about this in the book and talked about it, but a few years ago I had a student who moved directly from cities in China to the United States to Monroe and uh, found out uh, that the student said that he had never seen a day where there was a complete blue sky from morning to night until he moved to the United States. And that really made it hit home for me uh, more than any of the... Uh, stuff that I had uh, heard before or read about or even pictures I had seen. So air pollution is a local issue, but it's also a global issue because we know that because of circulatory wind patterns, uh, nothing stays in one local area. So some of the effects of this, um, uh, have, uh, this uh, China, things that have gone on in China have spread to Korea, across the Pacific Ocean and even to parts of the United States. So in Los Angeles, they are picking up readings that they attribute to things that are happening in China. So we are all connected in those ways and in ways that uh, we are beginning to realize more and more. So um, they are, <coughs> excuse me, uh, taking steps in China and India to reduce the air pollution. And that's some good news. All right, so here's the idea of the uh, brown cloud. It can be seen from space and it cuts down on photosynthesis, cuts down on the amount of sunlight that comes in, and obviously overall probably not the greatest thing in the world. Uh, okay, so there is the pervasive uh, uh, air pollution. We've done a good job in the United States of clearing this up, but we used to have a similar thing in our cities. New York City uh, used to have this kind of problem, and uh, we've really been able to cut down on it, and that is the good news. Okay, so how does pollution move around? One thing we already know about the atmosphere, that our air, is that it varies in density and in pressure. And we also know that things will move from high pressure to low pressure, and they will move from high density to low density. So that gets the idea of how some of this movement is going on. We also can mention that uh, air moves from hot to cold, and that comes into play as well for moving uh, all kinds of things around in the atmosphere. Okay, so the troposphere, this is where we live. Gravity holds this uh, atmosphere close to the surface here. Uh, we know that there's oxygen in the air that we breathe, and uh, but the major component is nitrogen. That's a good thing to know. And this idea of weather and climate have a lot to do with this movement of air that we're talking about. This helps the chemicals move around, uh, this helps the nutrients move around, and it also helps the uh, pollution move around which is maybe not the best thing in the world, but we've already talked about the role of the weather and climate here with the atmosphere and these changes. All right, stratosphere is a little bit uh, higher up and uh, very similar to what we have here, but there is an ozone layer there that is a good thing. This filters out the UV radiation, helps cut down on sunburns and cancers because of that, and this is above the, uh, uh, above the troposphere. So, oh, here we go. Here is your idea of the stratosphere being above the troposphere. Okay, there you go. Okay, so air pollution comes from natural sources. We know this um, already. Uh, volcanoes, wildfires, plants will re uh, release these things. So there are natural things. They will be moved around by the wind, but we have exasperated it now, uh, and mostly where we're doing our in industry and also where we have a large amount of automobiles. So we have stationary sources such as industry, and we have mobile sources uh, such as automobiles. 
All right, this is uh, something that's been happening for a long time here. As soon as we figured out how to make fire, we were putting things into the atmosphere, but it really kicked off when we figured out how to burn coal, and that was the Industrial Revolution. So uh, once we figured this out, uh, this changed things in a big way, and uh, we started getting this fog over cities. And uh, finally, um, in some cases, we said we've had enough of that and we did something to clear it up. So this was happening in London, which was industrialized and very coal-driven. And uh, they came up with the Clean Air Act in 1956, and it also happened in the United States. In the United States, as I mentioned, in New York City, they had a problem with all this stuff. So in uh, 1963, there was an incident where people were uh, getting very sick, and some people were dying as well. And in Denora, they had a in a relatively short people a short period of time, a lot of people die and a lot of people get sick. And this was due to a temperature inversion that trapped the pollution in, and the pollution couldn't escape. Escape, and uh, uh, that I'll talk about temperature inversions a little bit more. But it was this incident in Denora that really kicked off the Clean Air Act for the United States. Okay, so again, uh, we're with all forms of pollution, we're going to want to be able to name names. Primary pollutants are what go into the atmosphere, what, what gets put in there, and secondary pollutants are pollutants that are uh, also troublesome and they come from reactions that are in the atmosphere. So in the developed countries, as I mentioned, we have been able to do that. And in the developing countries, um, they still have to worry about it. Indoor air pollution is an interesting thing to be talking about in both the developed and the developing uh, worlds. But now in the developing world, uh, they are still burning wood inside a lot more than we did, coal inside in some cases. And of course, these make the indoor uh, situations uh, a little bit rough uh, to deal with pollution wise. All right, this is a good uh, thing for you to get figured out here as far as primary pollutants and secondary pollutants. So we have the idea of the natural sources, the volcanoes, the uh, coal burning that we have that are putting things into the air, the mobile sources as well. So it's very good in your naming names to be able to talk about the primary pollutants that we have up here as well as the secondary pollutants. And we'll talk more about how they're formed and what the problems are. Here is uh, HNO3 as a secondary pollution and H2SO4, nitric and sulfuric acid that will lead to acid deposition. And uh, there's the ozone, the O3 uh, that we're talking about as far as being a negative and a part of photochemical smog that we'll talk more about. But very good to be able to name names, know about the primary pollutants and also about the uh, secondary pollutants. Okay, so here's a little bit of a closer up view and you might want to pause and uh, be able to take a look at these and again be able to name names. Okay, moving on here, uh, this is bringing home the idea of indoor air pollution and uh, whether they are making products or trying to heat their home, uh, doing all of this burning indoors is uh, problematic. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the major outdoor pollutants. And I should point out here that, uh, I will point out that there are what they call the six criteria air pollutants that we're supposed to be worried about. And uh, this starts off the first one here, these carbon oxides. So carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, a big source of them is burning fossil fuels for our automobiles. Um, also for clearing out forests, we know, that release the CO2. And uh, these have an impact here. They are rough on the lungs. They can interfere with the blood, getting oxygen uh, around in the body. And so these are pretty detrimental things, these carbon monoxides and these carbon dioxides. Now, as far as car exhaust goes, um, a catalytic converter is a device that is now mandatory on automobiles that cuts down on the carbon oxides, cuts down on the carbon monoxide and the carbon dioxide that are released. So good to know that a catalytic converter can do that for you. Okay, here come the second and third of the criteria pollutants. Here's the nitric oxide. 
Uh, again, these are going to come from uh, cars as well. Uh, they're also going to come from burning coal, both of these things here, uh, the uh, nitric oxide and the sulfur dioxides. Um, you're going to see in the secondary pollutions that NO2 is formed. So NO and NO2 are referred to as NOx. Um, with a little X after the O there to say that it could be one, it could be two, and also with sulfur uh, dioxide um, and sulfur trioxide, they're going to call those socks with a little XX after the O uh, to indicate that it can be a couple of different things there. Okay, so uh, both of these are, because of the nitric acid and sulfur, Furic acid going to be um, talked about with acid deposition, which can endanger plant growth, uh, can harm buildings, can harm statues, um, and generally causes a bunch of problems here as it moves through the atmosphere. Uh, so that's the idea of there. Um, both of these are implicated in causing breathing problems, uh, so they're difficult for that, and uh, of course that becomes a human health problem as well. Okay, another one of the criteria pollutants are particulates. So these are just substances that float around in the air. Sometimes you see this when there's a sunbeam. You can see all kinds of dust in the air. Uh, so these particulates come from all uh, different kind of things. They can come from uh, tobacco is a good one, burning coal is a good one, auto exhaust, plowing fields, construction sites, um, all these things here. Problem is they get into your lungs, they get into your body, they can be carcinogens uh, causing cancer, can interfere with uh, lungs, like I said, for breathing, uh, and also can interfere with reproduction. And uh, that's the idea of the particulates, um, which come from a variety of sources. A lot of times when you see people wearing masks, they're trying to keep the particulates out. Okay, ozone again is a criteria pollutant, and for ozone, um, that's going to become a secondary pollutant, so we'll talk about that. And uh, also, again, becomes a big part of photochemical smog, which is interfering with people's breathing and uh, causes lung and heart disease as well. So that's the problem with those. Uh, volatile organic compounds are not referred to generally as a um, criteria pollutant. But uh, also worth pointing out here, these are uh, hydrocarbons, basically. Uh, methane is a good example of them, and uh, they are also uh, going to lead to uh, health problems as well. Uh, benzenes, plastic, tobacco, smoke, they can lead to leukemia. The uh, methane, when it's re released into the air, is a pretty potent uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, so there you go. All right, here is a good place to pause as well, and you should be aware of these chemical reactions and how they work for forming uh, these, different, uh, these different things here. So this is a good way for you to be able to name names, talk about how it happens, and uh, I'll give you a second to pause there. And good to be familiar with those reactions. Okay, we'll move on now. Uh, and here it is uh, stepped through a little bit slower for you, but same, same information. Okay, so here is just uh, an example of acid deposition causing problems, and there it is for the statue. All right, so now we are able to detect the air pollution a lot uh, in a lot different ways than we were before. So we're aware of what the numbers are and uh, the lichens uh, that are you know, instrumental in forming soil um, are very good indicators as well. So when they're healthy, they look like something on the left, and when they are not, they look like something on the right. So that's a, an idea that you're having air pollution problems. Okay, so lead. Lead is the sixth of the criteria pollutants, and uh, lead does not break down in the environment. It's a neurotoxin, so uh, it becomes a, a problem, of course. We used to have lead in our gasoline. Now in the United States, we have completely gone over to unleaded gasoline. Uh, it's also in paints. It shows up in lipsticks, uh, so that's very dangerous for you as well. Um, and like I said, it's in... Uh, uh, it's a, a neurotoxin, so it uh, interferes with the brain development, and, um, and that's the problem with lead. Okay, and again, with unleaded gasoline and unleaded paint, we have really been able to cut down on the amount of lead 
Um, so um, still some things that we are taking in from other countries have lead in them, so we have to be concerned with that from time to time. I do know people who are involved in painting, and uh, they say that the paint, for a while, the unleaded paint just really didn't stick the way the old lead-based paint did. Um, but now I hear they've come around with more solutions to that, so the paint holds on to the uh, surface a little bit better than it did before, even without the lead. So just as we can uh, create these problems through technology, we end up finding ways to clean them up as well. Um, so these are some of the things that we can do for uh, lead poisoning and uh, preventing them. And uh, you might want to pause. These are great uh, free response question uh, things to be able to take into account. And, uh, and there we go. Give you a second to pause. And now we're back into the video. All right, so industrial smog from coal uh, is a big problem here. So we've already talked about the uh, coal and the different things that coal is going to release into the atmosphere that becomes a problem. And then we have this general smog that has all these pollutants in them. So um, we've talked about this already, that we've cut down on in the United States and in the developing world, they're still trying to do that. This is another great place for you to pause. It gives you the source. It lets you name names. It shows you how the reactions happen. And, um, and these are really good things to be aware of. So uh, the way that the sulfur from the coal gets into the air is sulfur dioxide, reacts in the air with oxygen, forms sulfur trioxide, which uh, reacts with the vapor to form the uh, sulfuric acid. And these are very good uh, chemical reactions for you to be aware of. So you might want to pause here as well. And now presumably you're back in. Okay, so here again, this is the idea of the sulfur and the uh, how the carbon gets into the air. Okay, from burning coal and oil. So that'll be fossil fuel burning as well. All right, so photochemical smog has all these different things in him. I'm going to show you a, a diagram that talks about this, but again, this uh, interferes with respiratory situations for humans, gets into the blood, and that uh, causes all kinds of problems here. So here is the idea of nitrogen and how it gets into the atmosphere and also gives you an idea and a good place to pause of how these reactions go. And so I'll give you a second to pause. And now presumably you're back in. Um, I would say a really good thing with these diagrams is to get them down where you can draw them. If you can draw the chain of uh, how the air pollution gets into the air, you know you're on, uh, on the right track there. Uh, that would be a good way to do it. Okay, so here's photochemical smog in Chile. Now, the uh, mountains around here prevent the pollution from escaping. Uh, so that becomes a little bit of a problem, and that's involved in temperature inversions as well, which trap the pollution in, and if the, if the climate conditions or the weather conditions are set up in a certain way, this can keep the uh, pollution from uh, leaving, so it'll stay in the area for a while and will just continue to build up, and that creates some real big problems, and that's what happened in Denora. And I'll show you those temperature inversions in a diagram in a little while. Okay, so here are things that can help uh, to take the air, outdoor air pollution out of the air. Gravity can settle out the particulates. Rain and snow can bring them out. By the way, for industrial processes, that's a good thing to talk about too. Just as rain and snow can bring it out, they also use scrubbers that can uh, take them out of the uh, system. So that's something to be aware of. The winds can move them, but of course they can move them to other, rea uh, other places. And also in the chemical reactions, they can cut down on the pollution uh, of course, they can also, we found out, form secondary pollutions, uh, pollutants as well. Okay, so here are some of the things that increase the outdoor air pollution, and uh, that's the, uh, the buildings, uh, the hills and the mountains, the higher temperatures, and uh, the grasshopper effect is the idea uh, that there are going to be pollutants that are going to go one place, get up into the atmosphere, and then they move other places. Uh, typically, because air goes from hot to cold, they will go from tropical areas and move over to maybe the Arctic. So they'll find these pollutants in the Arctic uh, where you really wouldn't expect them to be, but that's the grasshopper effect, that these pollutants are going to jump other places. 
All right, so here's the idea of the uh, temperature inversions. Usually what happens is hot air flows to colder air. So if there is hot air during the day, uh, as the temperatures cool at night, there will be a... Uh, a setup here where the the pollutants with the hot air are going to rise up into the air. But if you have uh, tall buildings and also maybe mountains around, warmer air can uh, be trapped on the top layer. And that means that the uh, the air pollutants will go nowhere because uh, the air flows from hot to cold. So the cooler area here with all the pollutants that have been trapped in here have nowhere to go and it's good to be able to uh, talk about the idea of the uh, temperature inversions. And again, like I said, that's what happened in Donora, Pennsylvania. And uh, that's what happens in Chile and in Mexico City and a lot of places. All right, I've already talked about the idea of acid deposition. So you should be thinking of acid deposition mo mostly as sulfuric and nitric acid. Those are the two for acid deposition. Uh, they come down as acid rain. We've talked about those as well. The winds will bring them in there. Where can you get rid of these or how can you? Buffers are added. Lime can be added to that. Uh, sodium hydroxide can be added and that will help to buffer out, but it's a costly thing to clean up. So here's another good one for you to be aware of in how these things are happening. And uh, then these things also get into the water as well. And uh, yeah, limestone is also uh, good for buffering uh, this stuff. But again, another good one to pause, take a look at, and be aware of how these things are going to go through the atmosphere. Okay, presumably you are back again. All right, so these are the places where there are big problems, and um, so this is a good thing to be aware of as well. And a quick pause will help you out as I move on. And here I am, moving on. Okay, so we've talked about this already, how they can get into the water, and uh, this is the uh, harmful effects here. They have toxic metals that come out, and they are particularly bad for, well, all kinds of things, for human beings, for plants, uh, if they get into the water, uh, for buildings, for statues. Um, uh, there is some of these uh, things, they will harm uh, trees and plants directly, but another big thing that they do is they leach out the nutrients from the soil. And that's the real big problem, the major problem, is the soil nutrients are gone, and then of course you reach a point where you can't have uh, plants grow back. Here is a great diagram for you to be aware of. And uh, again, a quick pause here and just making sure that you know what's going on here is really a good idea. Okay. Um, and here's an example where they figured that one out. And it was that the trees weren't really suffering directly from the acid rain. That happens to a small extent, but mostly it's the idea of the nutrients being uh, leached out by the uh, acid. So they found out that in introducing calcium to balance it out here helped to regrow the forest. So that was an experiment that figured out. Of course, uh, we can uh, prevent these things much easier than we can clean them up. So there we go. Okay, and again, this is kind of um, kind of a little bit of a review of acid deposition solutions, preventions, and cleanups. All right, indoor air pollution, as I mentioned before, is a bigger problem um, in the developing world because of all the ways that they're still burning coal inside like we used to, and uh, wood inside for heat, and uh, we have different approaches now that are a little cleaner. But still, we spend so much time inside of our buildings that indoor uh, air pollution is also still a big risk in the developed countries as well. Okay, and this is because they are greater inside than outside. So if you spend a lot of time inside a building, that becomes a greater risk as you are um, susceptible to these things. Okay, and as usual, these are uh, people who are having more of an impact here. We know that uh, children and the elderly have uh, immune systems that are not quite as strong. So sick people, smokers, of course, always exasperate them. People have worked in factories. 
And uh, here are the four most uh, dangerous indoor air pollutions, tobacco smoke. We become much more aware of that, so we don't let people smoke in buildings like we used to, uh, formaldehyde, and it's good to know the sources of these pollut pollutants. And I have um, a, a diagram here that'll help you out with that coming up. Okay, um, also pesticide, lead particles. Um, really a good idea here to uh, leave your shoes at the door. That's a really good idea because you bring a lot of stuff in just in your shoes. So better to not have them around inside your house. And uh, of course, uh, we've already talked about some of these things as well. Okay, this is a good place to pause and get an idea of, this is just a great way of telling you the sources, the causes of problems, and, um, and what, the, uh, what the threats are. So really, take a good look at these here. Take a moment to pause, and you should be very aware of these uh, diagrams here. Okay, presumably you are back in now. And uh, here we go. All right, so there is all kinds of stuff that's going on in your house as well. This will make you want to get the dust out of your house. Uh, this is uh, highly magnified, uh, but the idea is that there is indoor air pollution as well. Radon gas is a problem as well. There's certain places where it naturally comes out of the ground, uh, so it's a good idea to find out if there's radon gas uh, around because radon gas causes troubles as well. And you can see in uh, the... Um, uh, diagram here uh, with radon that it uh, can cause uh, lung cancer and it can be in the uh, it's over to the right on your diagram here the lower right and again that can be a problem uh, depending on where you built there okay so openings in the ground are going to uh, head into this stuff here and that radon is something that you want to make sure is not in your environment Okay, so there's the diagram again. I'm moving on. And um, the body itself is set up to uh, help with some of this stuff here. We're naturally selected um, to have uh, things that are going to help us out. So our nose has uh, uh, hairs in it that keep things from coming in. Our sneezing and coughing get these things out as well. Our lungs are there to help us out as well. But when we compromise them from prolonged air pollution exposure and certainly uh, smoking, we are cutting down of these things that are there to protect us. So that's a good diagram to be as aware of. And uh, here's the idea of a healthy lung and a not so healthy lung. So breathing in coal all day is a problem. My grandfather worked shoveling coal into uh, boats for the Coast Guard for years and years. And uh, this is what got him the black lung. So he was very strong all through his life from shoveling coal and uh, was very weak at the end. Uh, because of the inability to breathe. Okay, so air pollution is a big killer, and um, and this is the uh, problem here as well. Cargo ships themselves are, are a big part of the pollution, so international trade brings pollution uh, to all around the world. And like we say again, it's just a, uh, it's a worldwide deal. Okay, so this is the idea of premature air pollution in the United States. And uh, because of that, we have come up with the Clean Air Acts. And uh, again, these are political things, again, that are going back and forth with uh, strengthening the acts or weakening the acts. And, and there we go. Um, I already talked about the six outdoor uh, criteria pollutants. You should be aware of them. And we have all kinds of things here that talk about where these pollutants are now. We can locate them in ways that we couldn't before. So the TRI, the Toxic Release Inventory, is a pretty important thing uh, to be able to check out. And um, it tells you exactly what the problems are in all different parts of the United States. So we are uh, cutting down on pollution in the, in the United States, but I've already mentioned this a few times over in developing countries. Uh, they're still having a big problem here. So we are relying now on cleanup more than prevention, but um, hopefully we'll get more into the prevention end of things. And as we uh, deal to uh, move to more sustainable energy sources, hopefully this will cut down on some of this stuff as well. Um, we have uh, lower fuel efficiency than other parts of the world here. And part of that is because gasoline, and uh, that can be a problem uh, as well. Or that's a place that we can improve as well. 
Okay, and uh, airports are exempt from these uh, regulations because they would never be able to hit the standards uh, that we have for other places. So areas around uh, airports are going to have more air pollution, and uh, there's no real way around that uh, right now. Okay, so these are some of the problems and how we can improve them in the United States. And uh, But it is worth mentioning that we have come a long way in those areas. Okay, so here are indoor air pollution. So we're becoming more aware of all of these things. Buildings are designed in different ways than they were in the past. And uh, maybe people like you getting involved will help with more of that. All right, here's cap and trade that we've talked about before. And the idea here with the cap and trade, as we mentioned before, is that they give you a right to pollute. So there is a certain amount of polluting that you're able to do, and you can, if you are doing the right thing and getting underneath that, the incentive to get underneath it is you can sell your rights to pollute. That's the trade part of it. And the idea of the cap is that they will lower the uh, allowable levels uh, year by year, and that should cut down on things. So some people say they work, some people say they don't, but that's certainly something that's being tried right now. Okay, and because of this, we have cut down uh, since the 80s lots and lots of ways here, uh, especially when they're building new power plants. Uh, older power plants don't have um, the same regulations. New cars have better emission standards. Um, so here's the idea of stationary sources. Um, again, I, I should say in the smokestacks here, something that they're not mentioning, besides the ones that you can look at here, uh, scrubbers are good ones to take them out the air pollution. Another thing that they do for particulates is they use electrostatics uh, to take these things out of the atmosphere. Um, if you ever had like an old television, you can see that they uh, draw in a lot of dust. And uh, that's the way I remember the idea of electrostatics for uh, cutting down on particulates. So electrostatics are a good way uh, to do this. All right, so there we go. And uh, here's some things that we can do with motor vehicles. And they should make some good sense, too. You should make yourself aware of these things. Give you a moment to do that. Pause, if you like. Okay, and here's the things that we can do for indoor air pollution. Again, I would recommend pausing. And hopefully you took some time to get yourself familiar with all of these connections that can be made. Remember, with air pollution, they do want you to be able to name names. Okay, so we're getting more into the point of um, uh, prevention uh, rather than cleaning things up afterwards. And that seems to be a step in the right direction. Here is another thing that we can be talking about. And again, I, will give, I would encourage you to pause. And hopefully you did that so that you could uh, take in this slide here and the important information in it. Great ways to make uh, connections. Okay, that's the end of air pollution. Like I said, with pollution, they do want you to name names. Uh, they do want you to know some of the chemical reactions and how they happen. Uh, so hopefully this video is helpful for that, and this will be material that you'll review uh, in getting ready for tests in our class and the exam in May. All right, hope this was useful, and I look forward to seeing you back in class.